Hi there, I am Zedigalus, or Zeddy, or Zed, or whatever you really want to call me. Uh, I'm going to be doing a Rule the Waves 3 campaign here and throwing it up on YouTube. I noticed there's not enough content on YouTube for this game and figured I'd actually do something about it, so uh, forgive any kind of technical issues at first. This is kind of the first uh, bit of recordings I've been doing in a very long time. I used to stream a long time ago and did some stuff on YouTube, but it's been a while, but straight into the game here. So this is going to be an episode zero. Uh, as with a lot of these big strategy games, you really do want to start with a episode zero, kind of just going over what you're going to be doing. Uh, there's a lot of strategy to talk about and such like that, and game setup and all that fun stuff. So if you want to just skip right to the gameplay and kind of getting into the main core game of things, uh, I will have a link below just to skip to episode one. Uh, so starting off proper here, uh, as you can kind of see here, we're going to be looking at starting with Italy. Uh, I've done a few different campaigns in this game already. I, my first campaign was Italy. I then did a campaign as the States. Uh, I've done a campaign as the Germans, and I've also done a game as the Japanese. Um, we're doing the 1890 start to start off nice and early. Uh, I want to go back into Italy again. I did consider doing Austria-Hungary, but there's a lot of disadvantages to that, and I'd rather be Italy. So one of the nice things about Italy is you still have a budget like one of the major powers. I mean, you actually have a higher budget than Germany, nowhere near the budget of Great Britain, of course, but your budget's, you know, one of the highest in the world to start, actually. Um, and you only really have ambitions in one specific area, which is really the Mediterranean. Uh, and that allows you to kind of focus, uh, and you want to adjust your doctrine about that. Uh, go over the actual country first, and then we'll kind of get into deeper doctrine decisions uh, in a minute here. So we do start off with the Prime Minister, so we are a limited democracy, which just kind of affects a little bit of the game events and how kind of aggressive our government will be. Uh, in this game, uh, you're not going to be directly in control of, say, the country itself. You're just the naval admiral. Uh, you're the Grand Admiral. Uh, you make the decisions for the Navy, and that's it. That's that's all you have choice in. You can influence the country a bit through some decisions, but in the end, you're just you're here to do your job. You know, run the Navy, make sure you represent your country at sea well, um, and if you don't do that and you lose enough prestige, you lose your job. Game over. Uh, in this case, we do start out with a high budget, like I mentioned, and these are kind of some of the special things about Italy itself. So we're cautious, uh, which is kind of nice because that means that your government's not going to be bombastic and start to kind of declare war on people randomly when you're not ready for it. Definitely can happen, but uh, for example, if you play as the uh, the Germany here, they are still cautious, but they do have a bombastic head of state, so that gives them kind of a bit of some unpredictability. Uh, whereas in this case, we don't have to worry too much about that. Uh, poor education is going to affect our research rate. Uh, we have an inconsistent naval policy, which means that our government sometimes is going to make some demands of us that don't make any sense. Um, they might turn around and just say, yeah, so we, we wanted you to focus on battleships, and now we want you to focus on something completely different. Um, and we'll have to deal with that as time goes on. Uh, we do have some corruption, so what that means is sometimes our uh, naval leaders, our captains, are going to have some... We're not going to have a choice in having some terrible captains. Uh, they're going to have gotten their position through, you know, prestige or, or money or bribing or, or whatever else, you know. Uh, so we're going to have to deal with that as it comes in. Uh, sometimes you get events to remove people from boats, which will be nice for that. Uh, or uh, you may have events to kind of kick people out, like if they do something kind of bad. Or you can just spend prestige. You can, If you've accumulated enough prestige as Admiral, you can just say, nope, I don't want this guy being a captain, but it will make you spend that prestige point. Again, you lose enough prestige. You don't have, maintain your prestige level. You lose the game. It's done. It's a game over state. Uh, our dock size is 15,000, which is actually huge for 1890. Uh, you can see we're actually on par with Great Britain when it comes to our dock size, and I don't think anybody else is bigger. Let me just take a quick peek. No, no, nobody's bigger. We're tied for the biggest dockyard on the planet. Uh, that'll change over time. Uh, but and I, I actually intend to hopefully maintain that. I, I do like to have a uh, kind of preeminent uh, dock size, yeah, large boats. Uh, we have some research advantages and uh, actually no disadvantages as Italy. Um, so we have a research advantage in just ship design, which is great. Uh, it means that we'll be able to kind of unlock general things about ship designs. Our ships will just generally better. 
um, so long as we still spend the money on that research. We do have bonus technologies. So our bonus technologies are in triple turrets. Uh, so we'll get those earlier than everybody else. Uh, motor torpedo boats as well. And this is interesting. The Motobomba FFF is, I believe, a torpedo uh, that does do some maneuvering after you drop it if you've missed your target uh, from aircraft. Uh, so if you fire it, you know, a, a fleet of planes uh, drop a bunch of those torpedoes and say you get two hits, but there's three that miss, they're actually going to start kind of going back and forth and try and get more hits until they run out of fuel. We do start out with the ability to make 12-inch guns. This is 1890, so ship design here sort of sucks. 12-inch guns are... we're going to have them. Uh, but again, we'll get into Doctrine in, in just a moment here. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and hit OK, get to the game set up proper. Uh, so we're just going to use my name here. And fleet size. The bigger the fleet, I kind of counterintuitively, the easier the game. Um, there's a lot more micromanagement you have to do with a larger fleet, but with a larger fleet comes a larger budget. With a larger budget comes a lot more flexibility. Um, having a small fleet, I've played kind of with uh, both extremes, you have a very limited budget, and building one ship is a big deal when you're playing on small fleet size it's, it's a huge chunk of your budget it's a huge part of what you do um whereas the larger your fleet one you might have a fleet that has 12 to 15 battleships building one battleship really isn't that big of a deal uh so in that case i, I do prefer the larger ones it also leads to cool battles i've never played with super large i, I, I will be honest i've been a little bit cowardly that way uh, and avoided trying to touch the super large fleets there is a lot of micromanagement in a very large fleet already uh and the battles can get so big that you you, you feel like you might kind of have you might lose a bit of a grip on it uh research rate i'm gonna leave that 100 um you can lower this down to about 90 85 if you don't want to be constantly dealing with uh ships getting obsolete you kind of get these stable plateaus of research where you might have several years where you're like, oh, okay, cool. I don't have to do any major refits or upgrades, which isn't realistic. The reality is, is at this point in time, uh, every time you build a ship, it's obsolete by the time you build it. And that's going to be that way throughout the entire game. Um, the, you can kind of get ahead of it by, by waiting for certain researches, but if you wait to try to make a competitive ship, A, you're going to be waiting a while, which means you're you're going to have to deal with your old ships for a while to keep maintain a navy or just not have a big enough navy to do so. Uh, or, and the other side of things is, is even if you do wait, by the time that your ship spends three years building, it's obsolete again. Um, it's, just, it's just part of the game. It's part of the simulation here. And, and it's quite fun, actually, to, to deal with that. Uh, you know, through adversity comes fun in this case. So uh, I think that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, tech variation, I'm going to leave this on slight, just means that uh, people research things a little bit around the historical date, not exactly on it. You can set it to considerable. I've actually not played with that. I might do that at some point. Um, but I think that could lead to some very one-sided battles where, you know, for instance, somebody's managed to get radar five, six years early and you still don't have it. Uh, and you're fighting like a night battle or, or just, like in bad weather. Uh, I am going to put on harsher peace deals. It just means that when you go to war, there's a much higher chance you actually do get something out of it. Uh, there's a lot of times in this game where you might go to war, you might be at war for a year, year and a half, two years. Brutal battles, you know, fleets being sunk. Uh, and in the end, you actually gain nothing. You might have even have a victory point advantage by quite a bit, but your country decides... Again, you don't control the country. Uh, the country itself decides, we just want to end this war. There's too much hardship. It, it, you know, our trade ships keep getting sunk. And since we can't negotiate for a, a good uh, peace deal, we're just going to wipe peace out. Uh, and you might win a technical victory. You might get some extra production out of it. But you you don't get any land. And while it's realistic, it's not fun. Uh, it, it's fun to paint the map, right? And, and get more territories and, and, and kind of go through that. So we're going to leave that on, or put that on, rather. Uh, for AI advantage, I'm not going to touch that. Uh, I think this game is very well balanced. I, I have won and lost battles. I've won and lost wars. Um, giving the AI an advantage at this point with my skill set wouldn't be worth it. Uh, and for I'm not going to slow the aircraft development. I find aircraft to be quite fun. If you are not a fan of micromanaging, don't 
you're going to want to check this. Aircraft are very, very micromanagey. Um, you're managing every flight of aircraft that comes off of your carriers. Uh, Land-based stuff is automated, but when you've got four or five carriers and they have, say, you know, several air groups each, you're going to run into a lot of micromanagement and stopping the game, going over all your stuff, seeing what's ready, seeing what isn't, setting up attack runs. I enjoy that personally. I, I love setting up that kind of stuff and watching it happen. So I really do enjoy once we get to the carrier side of things, but uh, I can completely understand why some people wouldn't like it. Uh, so yeah, we're really not touching too much. I'm just going to turn on Heart for Peace deals, put us on a very large fleet, uh, and we're going to go ahead and go to game nine. Uh, that'll be my YouTube game, I guess. You can see some of my older games. I do have other games here that I've overwritten. Um, interestingly, going on a bit of a tangent, and I will do this, <laughs> so I hope you're okay with that. Uh, I do tend to tangent a bit, but Japan's hard, man. Uh... I find that Russia and France dogpile you really early, and it's really difficult to get a good start. Uh, this save finally has had a good start, and I've been playing it for quite a while, but uh, now I want to try to do some recording for YouTube, so we're going to abandon that game. That's kind of my current game, uh, and we're going to go ahead and start this game nine. So I'm only going to take a quick look at my ships that I start with, um, and we're going to talk about kind of large doctrine decisions. Uh, we're going to save any kind of changing of anything for episode one uh but this game has so much to talk about and so much to look at early on that it's definitely worth kind of looking at that so uh apologies for my terrible italian pronunciation i am canadian uh and even my french pronunciation probably won't be very good because as much as i did do many years of it in high school it's been a long time uh so apologies in advance for any kind of terrible uh pronunciation I normally don't have to say these out loud. I just read them in my head, but now I'm narrating what I do, so we'll go from there. Uh, so this is a Cayo Dulio. Uh, it is a pre dreadnought as most of these. These have 13-inch guns, which tells me that this is made in probably Britain under license for us, which is interesting, actually. That's great. Uh, this is a good design, actually. It's very under-armored. This is, in essence, a battle cruiser or a heavy cruiser. Uh, it has no... It's not going to be able to survive its own guns. Um, but I think it's competitive because eight six-inch guns is quite nice. Four per side. Uh, and then having these 16 two-inch guns, not useful for too long, but early on against some torpedo boats and destroyers, uh, this may be essential, honestly. Um, but yeah. Ooh, two and a half-inch deck and 13-inch turrets. What a design. So with the 13-inch turrets, I mean, at least the guns won't get knocked out, but... And the 2.5-inch deck is impervious at this point. Like, deck shots won't... Will not penetrate at this point in time. And it actually is going to maintain its use for a while, although, you know, with it... Oh, does 18 knots? This is an interesting ship, actually. This is a good design for pre-dreadnought, in my opinion. Um, it takes a while for armor piercing to catch up to armor at this point. Like, armor tends to be very strong, and gun battles at this point tend to be slugfests back and forth and back and forth, uh, because you're fa having a really difficult time penetrating each other's armor, which might not work on this, but it's interesting. I actually don't mind this design. We only have, well, we have three of them, uh, which is not too bad. They have no negatives either. Uh, now, these three here do have this SA beside their speed. SA means it's short range and it's got cramped accommodations. Um, and you can see that with the tooltip there. Short range means that once you're at war, where it's at is where it's at. You can't really change its position, which yeah, for us actually doesn't matter that much being really focused in the Mediterranean. Um, it does matter to a point uh, when a battle does generate, it will look at the distance the battle is taking place from its nearest dock. And if you don't have the range, your ship won't be present. Um, so that can be a problem. Uh, they also only do 16 knots, but they might be better armored. Let's take a look at these ships. So, pardon me, I'm just going to have to do a quick cough. All right, that's better. Didn't want you guys to have to hear that. Just felt a, <clears throat> still is there a bit of a frog in my throat, but we're all good. 
So, uh, let's take a look at these guys. What a weird design. Wing turrets, limited broadside. 14, this is the opposite. So this thing has much worse firepower. This thing's firepower is pitiful. But its armor is insane. A 14-inch belt, 12-inch turrets, 2-inch deck, uh, going at 16 knots. Uh, I don't know if these can do cross-deck fire. Probably not, honestly. But we can find that out. So I'm looking at that card there. We can right-click on here, and we can actually just open the design itself. And this is the same ship you'll kind of see. This is what you'll see when you design a ship. So you can kind of see what the design is. Narrow belt. So it's 14 inches, but it's narrow. I don't like these ships. I do not like these Rogario Delorias. Um, they are not a good design. Uh, I, the 13 inch guns are nice. They're minus three. Oh no. Probably the same on the other ones actually. Um, yeah, these ships are not great. I was thinking we could use them kind of as a screen for other battleships because of the high armor, but they have no upper belt and a narrow belt. So the reality is, is these things are just, they're just going to get shot. And they have two six-inch guns, one fore and aft. Oh, no. Okay, well, this is one of those kind of hilarious pre-dreadnought designs. And, and this is historical. I mean, people did not know, you know, and it's not that they were dumb or something but there's no experience on what worked in this kind of ship like we went from ironclads you know that had no freeboard and had literal cannons mounted in turrets uh to pre-dreadnoughts really quickly and we're gonna go from pre-dreadnoughts to dreadnoughts pretty quickly too uh so everybody's learning one of the things you have an advantage of as an admiral in this game is you're from the future. I mean, you know, it is 2023. I know what naval history is like. I'm not a naval historian. I'm going to get that out of the way. Uh, I'm going to make mistakes in, in things. I, I have an interest in naval history. Uh, I really do, and I have been studying it for a while as an interest, but I'm not an expert, and I will make mistakes. Um, do feel free to point them out in the comments. I can take constructive criticism. Uh, and especially if I learn something from it, you know, if, if yeah, you point out something I'm doing wrong or uh, that I've said wrong, uh, I would love to get corrected on stuff like that and learn more, honestly. Uh, so these are terrible. Uh, let's take a look at another look at the Cario, uh, Cario Dulio. Um, and we're going to take a look at that. So this is a normal belt. No, it has a narrow belt. Six inch narrow belt with no upper belt. Oh, these are glass cannons but they're at least useful because of their their speed but these minus three guns so they're not going to be accurate and honestly you'd think that looking at this a six inch belt's not bad it has immunity from here to here but 12 inch minus two guns are probably better than these 13 inch minus three guns so the quality here is what i'm saying when i'm talking about minuses i'm going to try to do some minor tutorialization um, I'm imagining at this point in the game's life cycle, if you're looking for, uh, content related to it, you probably are familiar with the game, so I'm not going to go super in depth, but the first time I mention something, I'll try to kind of give a quick once over just in case this is your first exposure to the game. Uh, so this is just a general idea of what the quality is. It affects accuracy. It affects range. It affects almost every aspect of the gun. And minus three is terrible. Just, just awful. So these ships are minus one six inch guns, quality zero two inch guns. It's overweight. I take it back. These kind of are not great either. Low freeboard, which in the med isn't such a big deal. Weather in the Mediterranean tends to be a little more chill as composed to, as opposed to say like uh, the mid Atlantic or something like that. But yeah, so, I mean, a lot of time spent looking at our battleships, but that's important. Battleships are you know, the backbone of your fleet. Uh, I'm excited to see our heavy cruisers here. Let's take a look at what they're like, because these tend to be really important early on in, like, 1980. Two single 8-inch gun turrets, but four per side 6-inch guns and a bunch of 3-inch guns. 3.5-inch. Three this isn't terrible. It's not good. Minus two and minus one. The threes are quality zero, so that's nice. 
This is okay. Uh, it's not great. Uh, we have another class of heavy cruisers. So these are the Vetter Pisanis. Uh, and we have the... We have two other classes, actually. Oh, that's right. That's a light cruiser. We have the Amerigo Vespucci. Um, and this is a nicer design. I can already see. A little bit heavier. Can fit a little bit more to it. Uh, it has a normal belt with four inches of coverage, which is quite nice. Uh, four inches of coverage means at 3,000 yards, I believe. I think this uses, yes, yards. Uh, I'm Canadian, so I tend to use meters, but I will, and I will miss, I will misspeak. I will say meters sometimes, but I do mean yards. Um, but it has an immunity to its own guns from about 3,000, which is pretty good. Um, belt coverage is normal. The deck is one inch, which is, which is plenty at this era. And with eight, six inch, this is a nice ship. This is a reasonable design, actually. With 20 knots, normal range, normal freeboard, normal accommodations. Like, this is actually a quite nice design. I'll probably build more of these. Um, hopefully get some gun upgrades. Oh, I do have upgraded guns already. Uh, so these are a little old. I have minus one quality guns. So we'll probably do a retrofit of the one we have and then make a new version of it uh, with better, with the newer, better guns. Because with these guns, you can see at 3,000, I can penetrate my own armor. So the the, uh, the armor penetration goes quite a bit up. Uh, taking a look down at the light cruisers now. now. These are a little less important, but they're still important. They're screen ships, right? So with the Giovanni, Busan... It's a very small at 3,300 and very lightly armed. It's fast, though. I mean, these are going to be good for... I only have the one. No, I have two. Uh, I don't know why they're not grouped together. Give me a moment. When I actually play this game, I tend to group ships by displacement. I find that's more useful than just class. And that will also put the classes tend to be together. So we can see we have two of these uh, Giovanni Busans. Or Bausan. I'm not sure how you'd say that. Um... And uh, these will be fine for, like, colonial service or trade protection. I have an even smaller class, a Cleo class. Yeah, so these four ships here are pretty much automatically going to go into uh, trade protection. So when we go to war, we do need to protect our trade ships. Uh, you need to have a certain percentage of your ships kind of devoted to that. And smaller ships still can do that quite well. Corvettes, honestly, which are what these are here... Uh, can do the job just fine so light cruisers are kind of a, a bonus even uh, so those will be great for trade protection uh, taking a look at what other ones i have here we have the agora dot class uh, this is going to be with eight five inch guns that's that's fine i like this thing uh, open design 21 knots two inch belt with normal coverage one and a half inch deck which is overkill for a light cruiser but i'm fine with it uh turrets are two inches secondary guns have no armor which i'm not really a big fan of so these don't even have splinter protection but that's fine uh and we're running a lot of five inch guns i like this the ship's great uh normal freeboard normal accommodation normal range i am fine with these i actually may build more of these this is something similar to what i build early game in 19 or in 1890 it's really about the amount of guns you have in your ships like your, your accuracy is garbage you have only local fire control which means uh these guns are just being aimed by the guys running the guns like we got just sights uh, so they sight it in uh they probably have some kind of a, a table for range uh, to figure out their elevation they're gonna get an estimate of range by eye uh, they have no range finders or anything like that and then they're gonna fire take a look at where the splash lands and adjust um so yeah that's kind of what we're looking at there uh, so they're not accurate so the more guns you have the more of a chance you're actually going to score a hit uh, and as i mentioned before a lot of the naval warfare in this era is a slugfest you're just lots and lots of hits lots and lots of damage you're, you're really trying to store a critical hit somehow either a lucky shot through some armor it goes a certain way that actually stores something critical or you're looking to set the ship on fire and burn it down um but it's rare to get those critical hits you're, you're not going to penetrate belt armor very easily like a five inch gun you know we have to be under five thousand yards to have a chance of going through and that's at a 90 degree angle so if the ship is even angled slightly away from you 
it's going to have an effective thickness much higher than even three inches. Uh, so this is optimistic. The reality is, is we're not going to get many penetrations of these ships until we really close the range. And even then, it's going to be optimistic to see many. Uh, so the explosives and the, and the flames are going to do a lot more damage. And torpedoes as well. That's something I haven't been looking at. This thing is four torpedo tubes, one fore, one aft, uh, and then a port and a starboard one. So it, it's relatively versatile that way. I would prefer to get rid of the forward one and then add two more here. But honestly, this is a fine cruiser. Uh, I can see myself building more of these. I probably won't. I tend to design a new cruiser, a new one of every ship really early. In episode one, we're probably going to do that. Um, especially battleships. We're going to immediately start on a battleship uh, producing program. Uh, taking a look now at the Minerva class, or sorry, the Ur sorry, Minerva is the name of the ship. The Eurydice, Eurydice, I'm not sure. Uh, that's an interesting light cruiser. Let's take a look at that. So, this is gunned insanely. Narrow coverage of a three and a half inch boat, which on a light cruiser is fine. 20 inch. I might lie that. This might be the one I would tend to build. It's got the new eight inch guns on it. So it's got teeth. Like this thing can slug it out with other heavy cruisers or with heavy cruisers as a light cruiser. Um, it can penetrate its own armor up to 5,000 meters, which is pretty crazy. Although with a narrow belt and no extended belt or upper belt, it's a pretty exposed ship, but it's a light cruiser. It, it, it's not intended to take too many hits. You know, light shells from other light cruisers be nice to block. We've got 10 six inch guns. I love this ship. This is good. Yeah, this thing's great actually. Um, I like these and we have a couple of them. I might build more of these. I mean, the Triple E class this year, which is my last class of light cruiser. They're modern looking. Now, we don't have dual turret design. So these dual turrets, if I hit this button here to check, it's going to tell me these have a lower rate of fire just because of that. But we have a lot of single turrets too. These are six inch guns. We have a lot of these. This is not terrible either. 21 knots, normal freeboard, medium range, normal accommodation fine armor like these are good i'm not going to dwell too long on a lot of these cruisers this, these, these ones surprised me i wasn't planning on but the, a couple of these are interesting uh this class here i think is such a neat very neat class and I, i'm probably gonna build more these are a great battle like not battle ship but like a ship for our battle fleet um they can kind of do everything which is fun uh and then lastly, we have our uh, Corvettes. So these are not going to be anything impressive. Uh, they're just for trade protection and, and, you know, kind of if we have a, a colonial aspirations to kind of have those in the water around our colonies to be able to maintain, we uh, make sure we maintain order in our colonies. Uh, they're slow. Uh, we have two different classes. They're slow. We have five inch guns. They're, they're nothing special. I have made in early games like this uh, Corvettes that end up in the battle fleet because they actually can be really flexible and nice ships, but these ones aren't. So that's that. We've looked at our ships. Um, we don't know anything about our captains currently. If you look at my officers, well, we have some that we know a little bit about. So this guy's above average. He gets seven years of experience. He's on one of our battleships, so that's really good to see. And this is what I'm talking about when I was talking about corruption earlier. This guy is on a battleship. He has below average ability. And you think, well, how the heck does he get a, a, a battleship captaincy? Well, he's well connected. Uh, you know, so he knows people. He's able to pull some strings and be like, I want a prestigious position. And, uh, you know, end up getting a bunch of people killed because he doesn't have the actual experience to run a battleship. So this battleship is going to run not as good as it normally could because the captain and running it really isn't qualified to do what he's doing but that's fine uh we don't know much about the rest of everybody else look at this though this guy needs to go there i might change the settings i normally don't do manual management of officers but you know what i think i'm going to from this time so i'm going to go on preferences and this is where you can adjust all the preferences for the game of course 
Uh, we are playing on Rear Admiral, which is the default. Uh, everything else is pretty much default except for some of the graphic such uh, things to show you, like where your ships are moving and such. But there should be an option, and I might do this between episodes if I don't see it quickly. Ah, there, auto assign officers. Let's not do that. Um, I kind of. I, was, I wanted to really kind of try that this time, so I might get frustrated about it. It might be too much micromanagement for me, and we may turn that off, but we're going to leave that on. All right. Finally, I think I've been kind of teasing about the whole game. Let's discuss Doctrine. Well, actually, again, annoyingly, I'm going to kind of push it off again. I just clicked on Ships Under Construction, uh, so we can see what we have here very quickly. We have another one of these guys being built. How long? 15 months out. I might even cancel that. Um... We'll see again. Episode one, I'll make that decision. Uh, I might cancel this and and design a new battleship to build because we can build ships four thousand tons bigger, which is just usually advised. You should build the biggest battleships you can, uh, which goes into our doctrine. Nice. Hey, there's a good segue. Um, so, doctrine wise, for the Italians here, I've done a little bit of thought, and we have some advantages being Italian. We really only have, at the beginning of the game at least, aspirations in the Mediterranean, and that really does shape what our doctrine is going to be quite a bit. A lot of these other nations, like France, who's probably one of our main rivals, um, they have colonial empires everywhere. Like France is in the Caribbean, and Africa, and the Indian Ocean, they're going to be in the South, they're everywhere, they're all over. And so they actually have to maintain fleets that are able to go everywhere uh, and do everything. They can't concentrate their fleet in one position. Whereas with the Italians, I can't. I, I only have one sea zone to really focus on. Uh, and until I've taken all the Mediterranean and rebuilt the Roman Empire, or however you want to put it there, um, you know, we are going to only have ambitions in one or two areas. And if I lose, say, uh, Etruria, which I believe is kind of the northern area by uh, Ethiopia, um, you know, if we lose that, I'm not that bent out of shape. I don't care too much about other possessions. I would love to kind of turn Italy into a world power, and that is going to be a goal. But getting back to Doctrine, because we're in the Mediterranean only, I'm going to maintain a very powerful fleet, an expensive fleet. I'm not going to settle for a large fleet of mediocre ships uh, like you might have to being somebody with a lot of colonial powers. I'm going to run one major fleet that patrols my major ocean that's top of the line. I'm going to spend a lot on research. I'm going to try to get uh, kind of the best of the best and maintain that because then... No matter who I'm fighting, I will always have my fleet available, um, just due to the fact that we only have the one zone. Uh, it's expensive to do so. There are definitely other ways to play as other countries, and I'm not saying like the like I'm picking on France because they're my main rival, but I'm not saying France would be wrong for doing what they're doing, which would be we're doing what they'll probably do and what I would do if I was them, uh, which is, you know. You gotta have cheaper ships. You have to have many more ships. So you have to be cheaper. We're gonna be expensive. We're gonna have, you know, think Ferraris, right? Being uh, stereotypically Italian, we're gonna have the Ferraris of ships, uh, and they're going to be incredibly top of the line, incredibly expensive. Um, but I think that's the way to play them. Uh, it's really leveraging your main advantage, uh, and your main advantage is, as I've said several times, just the the one C zone. With that out of the way, though, um, I guess a bit more specific. What that means is battleship supremacy. You know, we're going to build an expensive fleet, lots of battleships, and lots of screen ships. I'm probably going to skip heavy cruisers later. Early on, they're really useful, but later on, it's going to be basically battleships and screen ships, and that'll be it. But yeah, I think this has droned on for quite long enough, uh, been about half an hour, which is kind of how I want episodes to be. Uh, I guess as an episode zero final thing here is uh, kind of time frame for episodes to come out. I don't have a set schedule. Uh, this is not a job for me. I do work full time. I do have a kid uh, that I have you know, a young kid uh, that I have to take care of. Uh, and as such, time to record is few and far between. 
I don't think it'll be super rare. I'm kind of hoping, and this isn't a promise, but it's a hope, you know, a couple episodes a week. Um, and probably for the first couple of weeks, maybe several episodes, because I'm going to be excited and uh, I do have more time right now than I normally would. So, uh, yeah, I'd expect an episode every couple of days, hopefully. Uh, and next episode, we'll actually get into building ships, designing ships, and uh, getting into the actual game. But for now, again, I'm uh, Zedigalus, and uh, this has been episode zero of Rule the Waves. <laughs>